So today we're going to be talking about chapter 27, and that is the brave new world, communism on trial. Ironically, over the weekend, I watched the movie 1984, which is not directly tied to communism. It's more of a critique on totalitarianism. Uh, it's an excellent movie starring John Hurt as Winston, the main character from George Orwell's uh, dark dystopian future, 1984. And it's a, a grim look at what the world could look like uh, if people were to turn to totalitarianism. So I recommend the movie. It's depressing, but it's worth viewing. So the first thing I want to look at is just a shop in Moscow. As we're putting communism on trial with this week's chapter, um, there's the irony that commerce was still ongoing throughout communist Russia. That there never was a time in any of the communist countries that we've looked at where there was no economy, where there was no buying and selling. Uh, people shopped for goods, um, people uh, were able to accumulate wealth, uh, though the tax rates of many of these communist countries were much higher than that of uh, capitalist nations. Uh, people were still able to rise to prominence and still able to buy uh, consumer goods. And so let's begin by looking at the transition from Stalinism or the Soviet Union under Joseph Stalin uh, to uh, a much different ruler, Nikita Khrushchev. Now, the Soviet Union is one of two superpowers after the Second World War. Meaning after this, you know, Great Britain was in shambles literally and both economically. Uh, most of Western Europe had to be bailed out by the United States. Uh, Eastern Europe was falling under the sway of communism and Southeast Asia as well. Um, the world was affected by the Second World War. But the Soviet Union and the United States emerged as the two leading superpowers in the world. Now, 30 million Soviets died as a result of the Second World War. So there was enormous destruction on Soviet soil versus the um, relative small amount of destruction that the United States. 30 million Soviets dead versus a much smaller percentage of United States soldiers and civilians. So after the war, Agricultural production in the Soviet Union was about 50% of what it had been prior to the war. Steel production was at about 60% of its pre-war levels. And um, so these difficult conditions that we've discussed with the rise of communism endure and life is difficult for the average Soviet citizen. Now meanwhile, Joseph Stalin's goals during the Second World War were very much imperialistic. He was out to conquer territory. And Russia did conquer a great deal of territory. Most of Eastern Europe, large parts of uh, Southern Asia. And Stalin plundered these areas for raw materials. Now, during Stalin's reign, following the Second World War, there were very few consumer goods produced. Though, by 1947, the pre-war economic levels were essentially matched. So, meaning that the output, the gross domestic product of the Soviet Union was roughly equivalent to that of the pre-war Soviet Union. Yet, the people, the average Soviet citizen was still suffering. The question is, why is this so? So, what is the typical consumer goods situation like for most of the history of the Soviet Union? So, back to the picture of the shop. What was it like as a 
average Soviet citizen buying and selling consumer goods. Now, for one, throughout the late 1940s, uh, there's quite a bit of political repression. This is life under Stalin, totalitarian regime. Nine million following the Second World War, nine million Soviets were sent to the gulags. These were the work camps, like concentration camps, um, though without crematoria, people were simply worked until they died. Now, when Stalin died in 1953, he was never able to accomplish many of his grand plans, and thankfully so. Uh, like Hitler, he was a notorious anti-Semite. Uh, he blamed the Jews for many of the Soviet's economic problems, and uh, he believed that the Jewish people were in a conspiracy against the Soviet Union. And so perhaps given time, he might have pursued some of the extreme ideas of Nazi Germany. Now, meanwhile, Khrushchev became premier or leader of the Soviet Union in 1955. And he began the process of reforming the Soviet economy and reverting decision making to the local level, meaning decentralizing a lot of the power structure of the Soviet Union. Now, again, the question is how successful was his economic reforms. And this process was called de-Stalinization. And these policies were undertaken shortly after he uh, rose to power. Uh, in 1956, he gave a speech criticizing Stalin, saying that Stalin's ideas were too harsh, that the gulags were making slaves of the Soviet people. And so, in fact, following that, he set a policy that released six million people from the gulags. Now, Khrushchev was finally replaced. And much of the reason for his replacement was the Cuban Missile Crisis that we discussed last week. That and a number of foreign policy blunders. And so again, much of the discussion between Khrushchev and Kennedy following the Cuban Missile Crisis was done in secret. The fact that the United States had to agree to release the nuclear weapons in Turkey that were pointed at the Soviet Union in exchange for what went down in Cuba. But all the world saw was that Khrushchev backed down to the United States. And so again, he was replaced. He was replaced by a man named Leonid Brezhnev, who took over and ruled the Soviet Union between 1964 and 1982. Here are some of the basic characteristics of his regime. Number one, the government reassumed control over central planning in the economy. So that localization of power re was reverted back to the Kremlin. Stalin's status as a national hero was reinstated, though Brezhnev did point out some of Stalin's flaws. But the idea was that, that Khrushchev was taking steps towards freedom that Brezhnev then withdrew on. Brezhnev was famous for suppressing dissent, arresting protesters, and in some cases even forcing them into exile. He increased restrictions on cultural expression, on personal freedom, and in many cases even tried to limit Western influence. Again, back to George Orwell's writing. One of the sad and depressing features of that story was how and why they were caught. Winston and his 
mistress were caught as thought criminals for thinking thoughts that were viewed as disloyal to the regime. And that may sound extreme, expressing dissent and the punishments that occurred in the book. But the sad thing is that's life under totalitarianism, that dissent can result in extreme penalties. And Brezhnev was following through on some of those policies that Stalin had implemented. Meanwhile, economic growth rates in the Soviet Union continued to decrease and stagnate throughout the late 1970s. Now, what are some of the biggest problems of the Soviet economy in the 1970s? The Soviets did do some things rather well. One of these, famously, is athletics. I'm sure you've all seen Rocky, where the Russian versus Rocky. Um, well, there, there was a time when the Soviet Union was famous for the athletes they would send to the Olympic Games. They were famous for sending athletes around the world on goodwill tours to compete against American athletes or European athletes. But now, after Brezhnev, the Soviet Union began to grow unstable. There's a period of quick turnover in leadership. And as we've seen throughout this course, that can create political instability. Next is cultural expression in the Soviet Union. All Soviet culture is expected to follow the party line. It was commonplace to hear Soviet citizens, particularly politicians, constantly quote, Karl Marx, Lenin, and even Joseph Stalin. Simply to prove the point that you are a good communist. Because it could be dangerous to view it as anything but. Now after Stalin, under Khrushchev, some of these restrictions lessened. But there were clear penalties for not towing the party line. Now sadly, a, a suppression of free speech uh, can even be evidenced throughout American history. For example, during the First World War, um, a film director had to cancel a film about the American Revolution because the British were our allies in the First World War and it was seen as um, not towing the party line to portray the British as an enemy, which they were in the American Revolution. Now, a couple cases in point of, of Russian literature during the Soviet Union. Dr. Shivago by Porus Pasternak won the Nobel Prize for Literature but he was actually unable to collect <laughs> um, because this work was seen as disloyal. Now the next person with his work One Day in the Life of Ivan and secondly the Gulag Archipelago was famous for criticizing the old Gulag system which were these work camps and he was actually exiled for his work. Now these um, suppressions of dissent were not just limited to the Soviet Union but could actually be found 
in the Soviet satellite states as well, like Poland or Hungary or, or Bulgaria or Lithuania or East Germany. Some more, some less strict. The famous example is the Hungarian uprising of 1956 where the Soviet tanks rolled through the streets of Budapest killing 40,000 protesters and quashing the rebellion. Now throughout the history of the Soviet Union, there were many social changes. You may remember when we learned about Karl Marx that the goal was always to create a classless society. This was Marx's utopia. That the first step would be a violent revolution where the poor take control of the means of production. And even Karl Marx said this would be done through violence. And then he prescribed a transitional phase with a dictatorship where this dictator was to oversee the transition to state-controlled production and a redistribution of wealth. And Marx's end goal was that if this step could be achieved successfully, then social classes would cease to exist. And so Lenin instituted gender equality, instituted a greater level of tolerance than perhaps could be seen anywhere else in the Western world at this time. And these social changes were based on this desire to create a classless society. The hope was, now perhaps they never quite got there, but the hope was that education would be the key to advancement in society. Now, as I said, women have greater equality in the Soviet Union than even they did in the United States at this time. But there was clearly still discrimination. It wasn't unheard of for women to be expected to work a so-called double shift, meaning it's a culture where women would work outside the home and then go home and then still expect to be the primary caregivers to their children and the primary domestic workers in their homes. Now, Marx's dreams of this advanced classless society clearly never happened. Though, for many people, life was actually better under the Soviets than it was under Tsarist Russia. And remember, it was the um, extreme poverty and suffering created by the First World War that even led the people to rise up and kill the Tsars in the first place. All right, so next we're looking at a map of Eastern Europe under Soviet rule. After the Second World War, the boundaries of Eastern Europe were redrawn, and as a result of Allied agreements that were reached at Tehran and at Yalta, this map shows the new boundaries that were established throughout the region. And notice that this map places the Soviet Union at the center of Europe. So the drawing of maps is a heavily politicized process, namely who gets to be at the center. So this map was drawn showing the Soviet Union at the center of Europe. Most European maps you will see place France at the center. What's the difference? It's political. Okay, next we're looking at a famous sculpture called a Stalinist Heroic. This is an example of socialist realism. Now, while Stalin was in power, and during the time of his successors, art was tasked with the purpose of indoctrinating the Soviet people. So this is a classic example of propaganda. And so 
this sculpture that we're looking at highlights public virtues such as hard work, loyalty to the state, and patriotism. And so this type of grandiose display was created to celebrate and honor the heroic efforts of the Red Army during the Second World War. And these could be found in every Soviet city. This is an example from the city of Minsk, which is today the capital of Belarus. So this is no longer even part of Russia. Now, Mikhail Gorbachev became premier of the Soviet Union in 1985. Gorbachev was young compared to his predecessors. He was talented. He was healthy. <laughs> so, for one, he was not likely to die of old age anytime soon. And he was intelligent enough to realize that there were enormous problems within the Soviet system. And he wanted to reform the Soviet system. And so last week we discussed perestroika and glasnost. But what are they essentially? What is perestroika essentially? Well, perestroika means restructure. It means that Soviet satellite states were given the opportunity to choose to leave the Soviet Union if they desired. And I remember this process. Well, what is glasnost? Glasnost means the freedom of speech, the freedom of the press, basic First Amendment rights for Russian citizens. It means that criticism would be tolerated that Western influences were to be permitted. That religion was no longer banned. That people had the right to speak their mind and not suffer consequences. We've had that right in America for so long we take it for granted. But it was in the 1980s that the Soviet people finally received this right, perhaps for the first time in hundreds of years. Meanwhile, back to perestroika, huge political reforms were occurring during Gorbachev's reign. For example, he began to allow limited competitive elections. We're not talking about the multi-party elections that Great Britain has with three or four or even five parties running against one another for power. I'm talking limited one or two parties with elections, though, by the people. Eventually, he even permitted non communist parties and leaders to compete for political positions. And that's significant because. From the beginning of the Bolshevik Revolution, any non-communist parties within Russia were suppressed by violence. And now under Gorbachev, these people are allowed to not only express their opinions, but seek peaceful democratic reform legally. Now, there are some cultural problems in the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union is famous for being the largest country in the history of mankind. And that's, that's neat as a bit of trivia. But in practice, that's difficult. I mean, in, in Western Russia, you have people that look just like Europeans. In far eastern Russia, you have people who are ethnically Chinese. 
And so you have this large multi-ethnic empire where these groups were all kept in line by an iron fist. And now that Gorbachev is beginning to relax and control, the question is what happens to these areas that are non-ethnically Russian? See, the iron fist is nothing new in Russia. Even under Peter the Great, the man famous for modernizing Russia from a rural agrarian backward state to a modern agrarian backward state. <laughs> uh, it's a history joke for you. Um, now, even during his time, um, he was ruling as an autocrat. He was ruling absolutely holding this uh, multi-ethnic empire in sway. And so the question is, what happens to these people that don't self-identify as Russians after they have the freedom to choose what they want to be? Um, Mikhail Gorbachev eventually resigned. Boris Yeltsin was seeking to usurp his power. Um, Many of the territories of the Soviet Union during this perestroika were choosing they didn't want to be a part of the Soviet Union anymore. And when Gorbachev resigned, he effectively dissolved the Soviet Union on December 25th of 1991. Now, before the Soviet Union completely collapsed, its eastern empire had fallen apart. The Soviets began to allow independent groups to take power in Poland by 1990. They were under a banner of a party called the Solidarity Party, meaning that these Polish people were joining together for independence. Hungary began to transition peacefully to democracy in 1990. Remember, that's the group that rose up, and tens of thousands of them were killed when they tried it in 1956. Now in 1990, they're being allowed to do it peacefully. In Czechoslovakia, communist rule ended suddenly in 1989. This was called the Velvet Revolution. In Romania, the dictator Nicolae Caesarea was the only casualty of the communist collapses. He was killed by the people as they revolted against communism. In East Germany, demonstrations began to break out. And the Berlin Wall was torn down in October of 1989. One of my favorite stories about the destruction of the Berlin Wall was the rock band Pink Floyd played their famous album, The Wall, in front of the Berlin Wall. And if you've ever watched that concert, there's this neat moment at the end of the concert or the people of the concert always shout, tear down the wall. And it has to do with the album. It's not necessarily the Berlin Wall. But at the end of that concert, and I've always looked for it. I can't find it on YouTube. Somebody must have filmed it. Where they're playing the concert in front of the wall, and the crowd shouts, tear down the walls. So if you can find that, email it to me. I think it'd be cool. Now, a few months later, after the destruction of the Berlin Wall, which was really the symbol of the Iron Curtain that had existed since the Second World War, East Germany was reabsorbed by West Germany. And that's a, that's a neat moment. Okay, and so I want to go back to this theme of capitalism in the midst of communism. In the late 1980s, communist leaders in both the Soviet Union and in China began to encourage their citizens to engage in not only private commercial activities, which you see in this photo, 
no, excuse me, we're actually looking at a photo of a Soviet farm worker showing off the fruits and vegetables that they have produced for private sale on a street corner near the Black Sea. Now on the right, you can see a Chinese woman selling her dumplings. Again, Russia's multi-ethnic. And as she smiles, the or as her smile suggests, the Chinese even took up this challenge of entrepreneurship. And so even though China, which we're going to discuss in a moment, is still communist, there is this irony of capitalism. Now here's the Chinese woman I was talking about, and she's selling dumplings, which you can see there. And... Um, I guess what I'm trying to get across is that capitalism in the midst of communism was ongoing everywhere. There was no such thing as true, absolute communism. It never worked. In 1949, in China, the communists under Mao Zedong had won the Chinese Civil War. This began a subtle and slow approach to becoming socialist in order to curry public opinion. Now again, I don't want to confuse this brand of socialism with the democratic socialism that's being discussed today. Two very different things. Um, because under Mao Zedong, or we'll just call it Maoist China, land distribution, redistribution was occurring, and collectivization, or the process of transitioning agriculture to communist collective, was postponed for a time. Agricultural and industrial collectivization began in 1953, continuing till 1955. In 1958, the, the Chinese Great Leap Forward was undertaken, and over 30,000 communes were formed. And so these Chinese communes were meant to create a system in which all Chinese people lived in apartments that were meant to be the same. And so this was the idea of communism. Now, in 1956, the Red Guard was formed to purge society of impure elements. This was known as the Great Proletarian Cultural Revolution. Now, this cultural revolution lasted 10 years until Mao's death, and it was defined as a time of ongoing revolution. Now, during this time, there was enormous instability and a constant power struggle between factions who were hoping to succeed Mao. Really, the Cultural Revolution caused the uber-radicalization of communist society. Is that during this time, the Chinese people were encouraged and forced to become believers in the communist system. The Little Red Book became the Chinese Communist Bible. During this time, many historical or religious monuments from China's past were destroyed. In uh, one absurd attempt to revolutionize or just um, completely turn back from the previous society. Shanghai even reversed its stoplights. After Mao Zedong died in 1976, the people began to turn against many of his ideas. Power was seized by Deng Xiaoping, 
And during his reign, the four modernizations became the centerpiece of his policy. And this is modernization would occur in the four areas of industry, agriculture, technology, and defense. Throughout the 1980s, economic incentives were restored, meaning incentives for um, innovation, entrepreneurship, a basic form of capitalism. And China's modern economic path really began in the 1980s. So is China truly communist today? Not in practice. Not really. Are they still totalitarian to some degree? Okay, so what we're looking at here is the um, protest in 1989. And if you continue to watch the screen, you'll see um, Chinese protest for the rights of freedom of speech, the basic constitutional rights that we have that make a democracy. And these are young students, your age protesting for these rights. This is known as the famous Tiananmen Square. Because even though there was economic liberalization, even though China was transitioning towards commercialism, criticism was not tolerated. And when these massive demonstrations were occurring at Tiananmen Square that we're seeing, Well, they were, they were quashed. What you're looking at are 
um, Soviet tanks rolling into the square where these protesters were marching. Hundreds, thousands injured. In a moment, I'll show you a famous picture of a young man who stood in front of the tanks, and no one knows what happened to him. Most Chinese people were nonetheless content with few political reforms as long as the economic benefits accrue. Large economic growth led many to predict China as a future superpower which you could argue today they are. Though there's an increasing division of society, many urban areas gain economic benefits while many rural areas are ignored. The government began to return to the policies of Confucianism as an answer for the weaknesses of communism and in response to influences from the West And so nationalism replaced communist ideology as a means of keeping the country together and a means of continuing the party's power. And this leads to more aggressive foreign policy based on these ideas of nationalism. For one, in 1979, there was an invasion of Vietnam. In 1990, China laid claim to the islands in the South China Sea. China even hosted the, the Olympic Games in 2008 in Beijing. And they continue this trend to mark the entrance of China into the world scene as a major power. Meanwhile, growing ethnic unrest is a consequence of this nationalism. For example, Tibet, as we discussed last week, was conquered by China, continues to be under the yoke of Chinese rule. But it has also led to a worldwide public outcry. And uh, potential exists for significant future problems in China. But for now, economic successes disguise these social problems. Lately, Chinese leaders have begun to allow more cultural reforms to take place to stave off political discontent. The internet is a great example of this. Though things like the Great Firewall of China keep it within party control. I don't know if you've ever heard of the Great Firewall of China. That is, that China's internet is nationally restricted Meaning, um, I don't know if you've ever in a school tried to look up things. Uh, here's the scene of the Tiananmen Square of the young man standing in front of the tanks. Notice the tanks stopped and they tried to move and the young man actually stood in front of the tanks. He was never seen again after that. That was 1989. The Communist Party is still of the opinion that without a firm guiding hand and limited reforms over time that things could rapidly get away from them. The world economic recession of 2008 has had a large impact on China's export markets and has begun to generate social unrest. And so I just wanted to show you this picture. I mean, I need to get this framed and put on my wall. That's Guts. He's probably about your age. Now, granted, this is probably the last thing he did. But he believed in that idea of democracy so much that he was willing to, by himself, make a stand. Now, the great heroism here is it didn't work out for him. But we will always have that image of the young man standing in front of the tanks. Um, Next, we're looking at the Cultural Revolution, more scenes of it. This began really in 1966. It was an effort by Mao Zedong and his radical supporters to eliminate rival elements within the Chinese Communist Party. 
Um, some within the party were accused of being capitalist rotors. Um, these people were often removed from their positions. Some imprisoned or executed. In fact, here we're looking at Red Guards uh, parading a victim wearing a dunce cap through the streets of Beijing. Next, we're looking at student demonstrations in Beijing. On May of 1919, students gathered at the gate of heavenly peace in Beijing to protest the Chinese takeover of the Shandong Peninsula after the First World War. Uh, these protests started the famous May 4th movement. Seventy years later, students and their supporters gathered in the same spot to demand democracy and an end to corruption in China. Here are the students today. As I said, maps can be political. This one puts China in the middle. And this shows the People's Republic of China. It actually shows China's current boundaries. Um, the major regions are indicated in capital letters. Um, as you see, there are still some areas that are disputed, and they're in green. Next, and speaking of Tibet, this is Lhasa, the capital city of Tibet, the home place of the Dalai Lama. Um, Tibet was conquered in the 1940s, soon after the rise of Mao Zedong to power. And the regime in Beijing has consistently sought to integrate this region into the People's Republic of China. Resistance to Chinese rule, however, has been widespread. In recent years, the Dalai Lama has attempted unsuccessfully to persuade Chinese leaders to allow a measure of autonomy. In 2008, during the Chinese Olympics, riots led by Tibetans took place outside the capital city of Lhasa immediately before the opening of the Olympic Games. Now this palace is a symbol of a Tibetan identity. It dates back to the 17th century and is today the foremost symbol of Tibetan nationalism. Now, how did the Chinese Communists govern originally in contrast with the Soviets? During the Great Leap Forward period, these opinions began to change. During that time, after the Chinese Civil War and the Cultural Revolution, from that time forward, China's timeline was different. In the 1970s, after Mao, private incentives were encouraged to increase productivity. The classic criticism of communism is if we all get paid the same, why should I work harder to become a doctor when so-and-so bum on the street gets paid what I get paid. And so that's why it's never really played out that way in practice. And there have always been these economic incentives encouraging innovation and entrepreneurship. China was no exception. Foreign investment was increasingly sought with special economic zones on the coast. And China even began to encourage tourism inviting people from all over the world. I mean, it's very simple now. If you would like to go visit China, you may. You can go walk the Great Wall. It's actually quite crowded 
because it's so popular to visit. People go from all over the world, and it's easy to do. So I guess the question is, why is that strange for a communist society? I mean, today, you can actually take a tour of North Korea. It's rather complicated. You've got to go through some hurdles, but you can as a private citizen. And North Korea is trying to encourage tourism. Now, again, they are still a totalitarian regime, but they do want to encourage people to come visit. Now, meanwhile, there was a reversion to higher education and science rather than Mao's little red book. There's a recognition that conditions in the countryside have to improve to feed China's large population and that the economy was stagnant there. So the rule responsibility system was created and the idea was to soak up excess labor. That rule incomes during this time began to increase dramatically though this too led to problems. Less land was devoted to subsistence crops, more to collectivization. Throughout the 1980s and 1990s, the implementation of the one-child system has always been troublesome. But the perhaps saving grace for the Chinese versus the Soviets is that throughout the 1970s and throughout the 1980s as the Soviet Union was on the verge of collapse, the average income of the average Chinese person was increasing. Now perhaps the one negative of that process, of that growing uh, per capita income, uh, was that people began to expect more. Now throughout the 90s, China developed its own stock market, allowing the trading of commodities on the public sector. Also, inefficient state enterprises close as public sector enterprises began to replace them. The state-owned production of consumer products and industry was not working. And so these publicly traded on the stock market companies began to replace them. This led to unemployment, which was actually a new thing for communist society. Because prior to this, everyone worked for the Chinese state. And if you didn't work, then bad things happened. Conditions in many places also led were also very rough, often leading to long hours and inadequate pay. The growing middle class developed a taste for modern domestic goods. Discontent in the countryside continued with wages often being half of those in the cities, leaving millions of rural Chinese people to move to the cities to find better life. Industrialization led to severe problems, like in the United States, such as air pollution. In fact, China's air pollution levels are ten times higher than that of the United States. Now, originally, Chinese communists ensured that women would get equal rights, though over time there's been a problem with this. Also, the Chinese attempted to destroy the traditional family as it presented a threat to the state. The Cultural Revolution encouraged family members even to denounce one another, helping to break the hold on Confucianism and family life. Because remember, Confucius taught that the family was the basic element of society. Now, post Mao, optimism re returned as people strive for better futures. Fashion changes resulted as Mao suits were replaced with more Western-oriented fashion in the 1980s. 
Religion began to rebound during this period despite previous drives against it. Some bad traditions have returned, such as nepotism, the mistreatment of females, infanticide, which is the killing of infants, arranged marriages, other problems such as growing materialism or sexual abuse. And with the new market system, there was also a problem of the lack of social security system for many. In culture, quote, art for art's sake, as in the West, is adopted, but was supposed to reflect the communist values of the country. Now, traditional and Western art was discouraged. Socialist realism was favored. The same is essentially true in literature, that only works portraying socialist goals or values are allowed. After Mao, there was no cultural opening, and traditional and Western-oriented art revived. The government, though, continued to regulate these areas. Uh, in fact, one famous case, Kenny G is big in China for some reason, and uh, when he began to get involved in the protest movement, the Chinese government threatened to ban the playing of Kenny G. And so he backed down and apologized and retracted his videos uh, protesting the Chinese government. It is still encouraged, though, to portray the Chinese Communist Party's role in guiding society successfully. Even Western values are now encouraged, though only those relating to technology and business. There is a desire to avoid the so-called negatives of the West, such as hedonism. All the same, there's a growing number of dissidents criticizing the current Chinese society. Now we're looking at the uh, damming of the Yangtze River. And this construction process over the past two decades is one of the most massive and ambitious construction pro projects in human history. Far bigger than the Hoover Dam, if you will. Uh, so it's designed to increase the amount of farmland in the Yangtze River Valley and enable precious water resources to be redistributed through drought-prone regions. This project has also caused considerable environmental damage to the Yangtze River and has displaced several million Chinese people from their ancestral homes. And so this photograph is titled China's, quote, Little Emperors. And to curtail population growth, Chinese leaders launched a massive family planning program that restricted urban families to a single child. So this is called the one child policy. And so uh, during this time, sons were especially prized culturally. Um, and so many Chinese parents um, began to uh, abort female children. And in fact, this has uh, caused a bit of a, an odd societal issue. I mean, usually uh, a society has half male, half female. Uh, China has far more men than women. 